Audio Things Frostbite 2 is the July 2020 download for members of the Music Production Club. Right now you're hearing an acoustic guitar, a cymbal, and a bass completely dry. Let's put Frostbite on the cymbal. Now the cymbal sounds like it's ringing out forever, and it has this nice depth to it. Now I'm going to put Frostbite on the acoustic guitar. Now I'm going to play a melody using my Dream Keys Ableton Live Pack. Now let's put Frostbite 2 on this melody. And that gives the sound new depth and extra textures. You can get Frostbite 2 by being a member of my music production club during the month of July 2020. Head over to brianfunk.com slash mpc to join. And you can turn a simple sound like this one into something really beautiful. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Sean Giovanni. And Sean is a record producer and engineer. He owns uh, The Record Shop, which is a studio in Tennessee. And he's also got uh, a pretty interesting course or collection of courses, maybe, called Mind Map to help uh, people get um, in, stay inspired and find direction in their musical career. And... Um, Sean has worked with quite a list of the industry's finest, um, all kinds of people, really. Like, where do you start? You know, I saw like John Leg Legend on the list and Brett Michaels. I mean, these are like household names you're working with. So, Sean, thanks so much for taking the time to be on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to chat with you. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad we were getting the time to do this. Um, it's it's really cool to just see the body of work you have, um, and the studio looks incredible out in Nashville. Thank you. So when did you uh, start the studio? How did you get involved in all this stuff? Well, I started the concept of the record shop after I, I moved to Nashville for a job that fell through at a studio, and it was a challenging time in the music industry, and the idea of like traditional employment at a recording studio had kind of disappeared for the most part. What year is this? Uh, unless you were extremely lucky. Uh, that was in 2006. Right. <laughs> and uh, so just challenging time for the uh, American economy as a whole, but especially the music industry and, uh, and even more specifically recording studios. And uh, I realized that I was going to need to figure out a way to supply myself with work if I wanted to make the impact that I had the vision for in my career. And that's what led to me starting to think about what the record shop would be and how I could develop a brand around the passion that I had and create something that would allow me to have the freedom to be able to spend the time that I have on earth focused on art that I'm really passionate about creating. Hmm. Yeah, 2006, um, I think I got my first laptop with Pro Tools in 2005. So I think uh -huh. that was like a major movement. Just a couple of years before that, I'd gotten like a, a little uh, mixing console and some ADAT machines. So the home studio thing was like really much more within everyone else's grasp at that point. It was really, I mean, now it's like, you know, you have an iPhone, you have a recording studio essentially. Right. But um, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a tricky time um, where things were really beginning to change. And you're also doing it in a pretty competitive 
environment being Nashville. I mean, it's like a music capital of the world right there. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of competition and it was a bit uh, daunting at first. And I had to learn over time how to get over my feeling of inadequacy and just dive into confident belief that I could find the right projects or the right people to work with and be patient to let things build over time. And once I was able to push past that, I realized that if anything, the fact that it's a competitive market is great because it's going to, it continues to attract an abundant amount of work. Mm. And so it's just, uh, there's so much opportunity in a town like Nashville, which is why I moved here uh, because I, I wanted to be in a major music market and I wanted to have the opportunity to compete, to work in the, at the highest level and, and of, uh, of art and be able to impact as many people as I could with what I was creating. So I think that I, I like the fact that I'm in a very competitive market. It pushes me to aspire to work better and harder and, and greater and continue to improve your craft and, uh, and not be able to just cruise along, um, you know, kind of halfway with anything. You got to be 150% with everything because there's somebody else that's probably hitchhiking in Nashville right now trying to start their <laughs> career. And I got to keep working harder. Yeah, it's not a town you can grow complacent in. And just uh, expect to sit on top and enjoy the fruits of your labor. You got to really keep pushing. Yeah. yeah. But as much as Nashville is a competitive community, it's a very um, supportive community. Mm -hmm. And I found very quickly that although I couldn't find a job anywhere when I moved here, I was able to find a lot of people to give me hope, uh, direction, advice, uh, people that I could call if I was in a situation that I didn't, well, how does this work in, in you know, in Nashville? How do you approach these types of uh, projects or set up this type of deal or that sort of thing? And uh, people have, have always been, you know, open door, open arms to, you know, to help uh, as far as, uh, you know, giving advice and, and support. And the, the community here is just really, really strong. Yeah, I've heard that before about about Nashville in particular, that, um, as much as um, it does attract so many people, there's like, there's a good spirit, and sometimes the, um, you know, the music communities can get very competitive. And um, I've been in like scenes where, um, you know, like your band is like against the other band sometimes, and uh, those never seem to last. And um, it, it's I find it's always better to uh, work together with other people, and um, you know just because one person succeeds doesn't take away from your success. It's not this zero sum, you know, all or nothing type of thing. Um, you, you know, people can listen to your music and someone else's music and work with you and Absolutely. another musician too. It's, it's not like, uh, other types of industries, I guess, where you're either with this company or that company. Right. Yeah, definitely. And that can transition through, through the course of like an artist's career as well. Uh, there were times, uh, earlier on in my career where I'd get really bummed out if like an artist that I'd done their last album with decided to work with someone else because I thought, well, we developed this relationship and I really wanted to be a part of, you know, their project long term. Um, but I, but then, you know, you realize over time when those artists end up coming back to you for a different project that you're working yeah. on. And it's just, there's no reason to um, take offense to it or take it personally. It's just a creative and artistic decision uh, in, a, in a lot of cases. And, and that was, that was a big learning, uh, point for me uh, to, to recognize that it's uh, the, it's not like they're, they're necessarily leaving forever. And even if they do, there's other artists that are coming in and, uh, you know, plenty of people to, to work with. And that's just kind of part of part of that journey of, you know, exploration. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of um, camaraderie that comes from that, just the kind of collaborative nature of, um, of music production. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as an artist, you would, you might just want to try something new out and it has nothing to do with, um, whether one person worked. And I think that's a good way to expand yourself and your creative palette is to work with different people. I mean, there's, there's probably people you really gel with and have a great um, thing going on with, but um, sometimes working with other people, you, you refine other aspects of your craft. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, definitely. So I, I never take offense to that if, if, you know, in that situation. And especially when you've, when you've worked, on a larger project with someone or maybe worked with them for a while and then they want to just kind of try something new. The, the artist especially is oftentimes gets a little awkward or hesitant about trying to have that discussion. And in some cases they don't even do it because they're so like 
scared of you know the the yeah. conversation. I guess they assume that most people would be like take offense, but I'm just like that's awesome. I can't wait to hear what you guys work on, and you know, hopefully there'll be another thing we can work on soon. You know, it's there's um it's a it's a big uh, family of uh, creativity. I feel like. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure that attitude is really helpful too, and probably brings people back to you in the long run to kind of give them your blessing and say, you know, good luck. And, um, because, uh, you know, you, you become like someone that looks as if they are lit- um, legitimately interested in the artist's growth and not just the work that you can get out of the artist. Yeah, that's, um, that's really what I, what I built the record shop around. And my philosophy as a, as a producer is focusing on the, the artist's vision and their, their long-term process. I really, loved hearing the stories of uh of producers that would work with artists for like the extent of their career for like long periods of time and they went through these this creative process together and it was a team that you know that worked together uh through it and there's a lot it can be a lot of value that comes out of that uh you know that growth that happens so i always focused on the that that long-term approach to things to really connecting with the right people as opposed to just looking from one gig to the next gig and i didn't start that way i definitely started just looking for whatever gig i could get to to help me pay my bills and you know keep my career afloat but i recognized over time that all i was doing in those that scenario was just chasing a paycheck and that's like not that's not at all why we get we get into yeah. a creative industry and you know want to make a living as artists um, we do that because we don't want to have, you know, don't want to do that. We want to have freedom. And, uh, and so it, it, it was definitely, there's definitely a point where I had to make a pretty challenging decision of starting to turn down work when I wasn't in a position where I should be, should technically be doing that, you know? Mm. Uh, but once I started to, to focus on, uh, taking on the projects that I was really, really passionate about and looking at that long term focus on things, things just grew so quickly and it wasn't, very long after that to where there was there was no issue with me choosing what projects that you know that we would work on and i think that that was a a big big lesson that was a big impact on how the the record shop grew into what it is now yeah that's a good point uh if you're looking to chase a paycheck there's many many other types of work that will be (laughs) much more fruitful Um, (laughs) there's a reason there's that starving artist uh stereotype um, yeah, but I, and I think that that stereotype comes from that that mentality uh, because there's plenty of money to be made in the recording industry, and I, I think I'm a pretty good example of, of someone that has been able to uh, create a very um, sustainable and substantial business model uh, out of just pursuing my passion and you know not having to do any tricks or create some sort of you know crazy system for it. I make records and and I'm able to. Gener- generate a lot of revenue with our company through doing that, but I but I'm not doing that through just trying to chase down one gig to the next gig. I think that's the starving artist mentality. I think the thriving artist mentality is to focus on your large long term goals and have a uh, a process that is focused to work towards them and make sure that what you're spending your time on every day is um, a purposeful. Mm-hmm. Um, use of your time to be able to work towards accomplishing those goals in small ways. And when I started to learn about taking small steps on a daily basis and weekly basis, and then being able to look back on the growth that's happening to be able to move towards those larger, seemingly unattainable goals, it was a really big shift for the pace at which my career started to grow. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're 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 working on a, a body of work and a, and a and like. A brand maybe is like a word we could use, um, but absolutely, I have a brand. I, I I am very proud that my brand is very strong. And mm. when I, I talk to people about like a brand for a recording studio, there was a writer that I that was doing an interview with, and he was like, you know, I've never like really heard a studio talk about like a brand before. The way that you describe the recording industry is, you know, is like super unique. But for me, uh, I had never even thought about it as being like unique or different. I just needed to figure out a way to be able to showcase the value that I could provide to people early on in my career when I didn't have a resume yet. And I figured the best way to do that would be to be able to create a a brand that had a really strong mission and a strong image and would support artists or clients um, in a a really impactful way. 
Do you have that um, summarized? Um, maybe uh, is there like an elevator pitch for for your studio, for the brand, for the uh, the vision? Oh yeah, the absolutely. Goal? Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. Well, I, the, I just uh, think like uh, sometimes it's hard to do that. You know, it's hard to like get that into words and and put it into something concrete. But I think once you have it, it it's just the guiding light for every decision you make. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's very strong. It's a, that's a big part, uh, a big part or a very valuable part of the mind map program that we have is helping creatives define what their mission is and then learning how to tell their story. Uh, the mission of the record shop is to help artists achieve their artistic vision and create art that will outlast it. And that comes from a very authentic place. It's not like fancy words that I tried to put together to be like a cool sales pitch. Uh, early on in my career, when I was just kind of taking on every gig that I could, I found that the projects that I had the most fun with, that I felt the most fulfilled by, were the ones where the artists were really looking for support from me as more than just an engineer. But And that's what really got me into the idea of like loving producing, uh, is that I could get them great sounds, but they really wanted like an opinion or a sounding board to um, bounce ideas off of, not just with like the sonic side of things or the technical side of things, but um, the uh, the lyrics that they're choosing the vocal phrasing the the groove the overall like arrangement of the songs and what when i was working with artists early on that weren't didn't have a record label or um or didn't didn't have the money to hire a producer and an engineer and a studio you know so they'd find somebody that was like me at that time just a freelance audio engineer uh wannabe producer that was kind of working you know your way through things and so i can kind of do a few of those things and i found that the projects that I got most excited about were the ones where they, they really wanted my creative input and it felt like a, a team, you know, effort. And then I, and then they started to tell me, I've, n- I've never had this experience before. I hear this all the time. Uh, when people come in and work with my engineers that are just booking the studio out for just like a couple hour session, they'll tell me, man, if they, you know, th- this experience was so great. Usually when we come in, the engineer just presses buttons and says, that's great. And asks for the money. And I'm, I'm so confused by that. Like wh- what sort of joy could you, and now everyone's, you know, goals or process is different. But for me personally, I wouldn't be fulfilled spending 12, 14 hours a day in a studio if I was just there to just collect an hourly rate and not be passionate about the art that I was creating. Uh, so that's where my, that mission came from is that I, I was really excited uh, authentically, not at a sales pitch, but that was the process that I enjoyed is helping artists achieve that vision that they were going after. And the second part of it is a quote that was really powerful for me when I had first moved to Nashville. I had a job that fell through. I was having trouble finding any work. And I was reading a lot about uh, philosophy and business and entrepreneurship and just trying to figure out like how I could find my path. And I read a quote by a philosopher named William James that said, the best use of life is to use it for something that outlasts it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was such a powerful way to encapsulate like why I was so passionate about creating music. As a, from a young age, I was, uh, the music had always been a soundtrack to different experiences in, in my life. And I can hear a song now that I had first heard in, in high school or middle school, or elementary school, and um, it had reminded me of a breakup or a party uh, or a certain like event or um, achievement, you know? And there's, there's it just these the sound just like brings back memories like a flood of memories it's so amazing and it's just i feel like it's a really great way if you're for me as a creative person that wants to make a, a, a massive impact on the world being able to create art that is timeless and that will extend beyond us i think is for me it's it's what i'm it's, that's that's what i strive for every day is being able to create something that, that will do that. And I guess that's my idea of like my legacy, not necessarily um, money or fame or uh, awards. While all of those things feel really great in the moment, they don't last very long. Uh, they, the excitement doesn't last very long after you get them and then you just want to get the next one that's bigger. So the one thing that I had found that, that I got out of that quote when I heard it is I just saw this like whole vision for a deeper purpose behind the passion that I had had since I was a kid and to turn it into something that could be really impactful. And so when I was thinking about how to tell people what the idea of the record shop is and what our our goals are and how we want to serve our clients, I did a lot of brainstorming and I just looked at like the things that I was most passionate about. And then I found a 
uh, creative way to combine those into a really strong statement that's authentically representative of, of what we do. Um, so for someone that might be looking like, well, how do I, how do I create that, you know, mission statement that doesn't sound like a cheesy corporate, you know, tagline, um, that was my process to go through and, and do it. Uh, and in our mind map program, we have a whole chapter on how to create a, a mission statement, a vision statement, and what we call a passion line, um, for creatives. Um, I'm glad I asked that question too, cause that's a, that's a great explanation. And, and you, you touch on so many things too, like, um, the idea of like the the awards, the accolades, the the fame, maybe or whatever it is that I think a lot of times, you know, in in our dreams as artists, you know, those are all parts they play in, but we get like very used to those successes once they happen, and then it's you can always scale it up to like, well, what's next? What's the next one? What's and um, I think that's like a kind of chasing something you'll never catch, really. But yep. having that philosophy, you know, of, of how you put it too, um, that's like, um, that's a pursuit that just keeps going. There is no real end to it. And it's just a constant build. And, and I, it, it doesn't, I think the fact that it doesn't have that, like, okay, here's your trophy moment, that it, it's like endlessly inspiring. Absolutely. And that's a big, that's a really strong statement. And uh, a good example of the importance of perspective, because when we when we look at things for that accolade or that thing, or if we or if we see, well, I I've, I'm never really feeling like I've got there, and then we start to get deflated or overwhelmed by it or bummed out by it, um, then we lose inspiration. But if we look at it as being this ongoing journey where every day is going to be a new discovery, and the experience is what we're really after then you have a totally different perspective that can help you maintain an inspired mind state, you know, longer. There's a book by an artist, by a writer um, named Jason Reynolds. Uh, the book is called For Everyone. And his story in that book encapsulates exactly what you said about chasing the thing that you can never catch. And he, put, he puts a really poetic, like, spin on on that. And it's the most inspiring book that I've read as a creative as it applies to fulfillment or artistic fulfillment um, ever. I was so excited that one of the artists that I work with um, introduced it to me. Uh, and uh, and I've been telling everybody about it. Hmm. It's, it's it, it was it had an incredible impact on me. I'll have to check that out. I'm always into that kind of stuff. You know, it's like putting fuel in the tank every once in a while. You, you just need it. Even if you know a lot of it, <laughs> just to get the reminder is, is Yeah, really absolutely. Important. Well, it's the great thing about charge. this book is it was written as a poem, and it's a, and so it's a very poetic story hmm. uh, that you can determine your own interpretation of okay. uh, as opposed to like a um, self-help book or something or like a motivational right. book, which I also love, but it's just a different type of experience. Hmm. So I think overall, like creatives, artists, producers, engineers would find maybe more on average might find more fulfillment from reading like that sort of book than uh, Think and Grow Rich, for example, which is like one of my other favorite books. Mm. Well, that's like it's a work of art in itself then if it's uh, poetic, as you say. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, okay. You said it's James Reynolds. Uh, Jason, Jason Reynolds, Reynolds. For yeah. anyone? For everyone. For everyone. Okay. I got it wrong. Yeah. So uh, I'll put that in the show notes if uh, anyone's interested in that. I know I'm going to check it out. I think I've got a, a credit in Audible right now that I need to apply to something. Oh, nice. <laughs> so maybe there's a, there's a audio version, but um, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we, we kind of, uh, you've mentioned a few times, but maybe we can get like a formal introduction. If you could tell us like about this mind map, um, the, the programs you have there, because it sounds like it's tapping into a lot of the stuff of inspiration and, uh, direction and vision. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the biggest challenges that I've found in working with artists that I'm developing, uh, or artists that aren't at the top level of their career yet, but are still, you know, growing and, and moving along. We're always growing, but the ones that are, you know, kind of starting out is the new modern recording industry requires a lot of business sense on the front end mm -hmm. to be able to get to a place where you've developed a brand or a product or um, a certain style that is going to be interesting for a manager or a label um, or an investor uh, to pick up on and want to get behind. 
And so the, the, the idea of like the artist development thing, while it still exists in, in some cases, uh, it's not as common as it used to be. And artists are really required to build stuff from the ground up for the most part. Now, there's always exceptions to that rule. And there's always some uh, star child that the label finds and they want to you know, develop in that way. But it's just not as common as it was in the past. And so I, I have had many experiences where I've worked with artists that I felt like had every piece of it from talent and creativity and a uniqueness and a sound. Uh, but where I saw them continually fall short was the consistency of doing all of the other things other than the playing shows and the creating music. Uh, and when I would talk to them about that process, a lot of it came down to just feeling like doing those other things weren't as like fulfilling and that they, they weren't as exciting. And there was this like disconnect between understanding that if you want to make a living with your music and make and build a substantial career, that there's a bit of like brand development and business development that is necessary in order to, to do that. And a lot of artists have trouble kind of getting over that. And I hear uh, not just artists, just creatives in general, um, even like engineers and stuff and uh, people that might apprentice for me, they're like, man, you know, it's be, it's be really cool to do what you do, but I'm just not good at business. Uh, and I asked them, well, have you ever tried to like start a business? Uh, is how do you know that you're not, you're not good at it because it's uncomfortable. Walking was uncomfortable the first time you tried it, but you figured it out because nobody told you to quit. They told you, you got to keep continuing to try until you learn how to walk. So I wanted to create something seeing all of the really great information that is out there to teach the technical skill sets of the recording industry, uh, to teach from uh, the, the business side of, uh, of marketing music, uh, promoting music, creating content, using technology in that way. There's all of these really great resources online now to be able to learn pretty much anything. But what I didn't see that was specifically focused towards creative people is a way to build cons uh, the habit of consistent action a focused intention about what you intend to create and the impact that you ho hope to have and a basic, like the basic foundation of, of building a business and building the um, willpower to go and actually uh, implement all of that knowledge that you're learning about how to promote your songs on Spotify or about how to mix your songs better. Uh, and so there's all of that information out there, but if you haven't built those foundational um, aspects of your thought process, your creative process and your business, your understanding of your business and what you hope to achieve, then it's really challenging to make really strong use of all that technical stuff. If, if you haven't built the, the strong habits of putting in the work to, you know, to do it in the first place. So I, I saw this as being a consistent challenge that I'd seen with artists just over and over again and people that I, that I thought and that I wanted to that see them succeed, um, but just weren't, getting over that, those, those hurdles. So I, uh, partnered with a friend of mine named Ricky Mendez, who's a, um, a very successful, um, mindset coach and sales consultant. And, uh, he, he consults with all kinds of different companies and organizations, uh, to help people improve their quality of life, find their, uh, you know, f fulfillment and, uh, and then with, with companies just grow their business, um, you know, monetarily as well. And so I, I thought, well, if I take like my experience as a, as a creative person, that's also, you know, an entrepreneur and excited about business. And then I partner with someone who like, that's their profession. They teach people how to do these things. Let's see if we can combine our thought processes and experiences to create a, a really great uh, plan to take artists uh, through um, this, uh, the, this process of figuring that stuff out. So what we landed on was something called the Creatives Prosperity Plan. And that, and that encompasses a wide range of, of topics, uh, mm -hmm. practices. And what I wanted to make sure that we implemented was not just motivating people and not just giving them philosophical information. Every episode that we have has a tangible action that you can take that week when you go through that lesson and something that you can continue on um, throughout the course of your career. Uh, that's one of the things that, that has really bummed me out about a, a lot of uh, courses or like technical information is that there's a lot of philosophy behind it, but then it's like, cool. Now, how do I apply that to what I do? And that's what we wanted to create was something that was, you watch, you watch a video, you have a, a worksheet to go through. There's a very 
uh, focused exercise. And then there's an example of why this exercise is going to be beneficial. And, uh, and a lot of it has just come from like my, my experiences of working through this industry and overcoming the adversity and kind of figuring it out. And I felt like I was in a position where I could provide some value to help people work through those things, uh, for them. I feel so fortunate to be able to make a, a living doing what I do and, and not, not feel like I ever got to go to work. And I want other people to be able to have that experience as well. And I thought this could be a great way for me to be able to help more people with it quicker. Hmm. No, it's nice. And that's definitely something I think maybe artists in general or and creatives in general are sort of like almost naturally a little bit against you know, any business salesy, it feels like a uh, counter to the artistic thing. If you know mm -hmm. what I mean, like, um, like it, it's the part that like, uh, dirties the art a little bit, but, mm -hmm. but you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's the reality, you know, and, um, having that all set up and knowing how to do it. And if you want to continue to make that amazing art, having a little know-how of like how to present it, how to, how to manage it. And, um, that's, that's important. And it's really, it's something I think that should be embraced really, because it's going to help you do more of that art. Yeah, absolutely. That's the way that I look at it. If there's, if there's something that I have to do that may not be as inspiring as sitting in the studio and making a record, but it's going to allow me to have more freedom to make more records, then hmm. of course I'm going to do that because I know what the end result is. And I know that, uh, how bad I'm, I want to get to that result. So I'm willing to do whatever it takes in order to, to get there. Uh, but if you say you want to be successful in the music industry, but then you say, no, nah, I can't put in the work to social media, just as an example. Um, well, you're going to have a pretty hard time getting through everything else that's going to um, punch you in the face, you know, along the way. And that's just the, the real reality of it. And if you're not willing to do that for yourself, you'll probably have to get a job doing it for someone else so you can support your artistic career anyway. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it, 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 when you start to see, take a different perspective at the value of taking those actions mm -hmm. and instead of looking at it as like, oh man, I don't really like want to do this. This isn't, think about the impact that it will have and then ask yourself, how bad do I want this result? And if you want it bad enough, you'll take the action to do it. And you can also find a way to do it creatively and enjoy it because you can see if you have the vision for it and the understanding of where you hope to get, then you'll be able to see how that action is moving you towards that goal. And then it becomes, at least for me, it's become more exciting to do those sort of mundane things that aren't as inspiring in the moment. They become inspiring because I know what they're going to lead to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that's, that's a great way to put it, to have that different perspective and understand like what you're actually building and what you're driving towards. It, that in itself, I think, can make anything in your life a little more enjoyable. Uh, I, I teach Absolutely. high school English as my like uh, real life job, you know, and that, then I uh -huh. have my music career of sorts on the side here. Um, but uh, one of the things I like to tell my students is um, like just the value of like a work ethic. You know, just that might be the most important thing you can develop. And when, when that becomes um, a, like a focal point for you, you can really find value in, in everything. And when you, when you decide like, all right, I'm going to do my best at this. So I can take something like I don't particularly enjoy like weeding the garden or mowing the grass or something and say, well, this mm -hmm. is a chance for me to practice doing my best at something. And at that point, it's, it's now got purpose beyond just like trying not to be like that weird neighbor that doesn't fit in with the neighborhood because <laughs> of the overgrown uh -huh. vegetation. But it's got this like bigger mission thing, mission for you that it's just to practice at doing the best. And when you practice that consistency and working hard and, and that just becomes like your normal, then it's not as hard to step up to the plate when you need to. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really strong point. Uh, and that's something that, I, as you said that, I started to think about the, like a, a habit that I started developing sort of like unintentionally 
about that. But if I, if I'm like the weeding example is a great example. Um, uh, last before, uh, the 4th of July, I think like last week, um, we had some friends coming into town. And so I was, I was out just uh, c- cutting the grass like I do every week. Uh, but then I saw that there was this whole like row of, uh, weeds that had grown up in this little rock bed that's, that's next to our property. And I looked at it and then I walked past it and then I looked back at it again and I was like, I got to clean this up. I really don't want to. But then when I get in those, those positions, I think I, I actually like go through that process of like, okay, but if I actually like go and do this right now, I'm going to be building my willpower to take on things that I don't want to do and just get through them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, it, I, I, I don't know where that like came from, but just when you said that, I started to think about that conversation that I had with myself last week. And, uh, and I think, man, it, it, it get, makes the, the tough things, uh, so much easier to, to work through because you, you know, you know, you can do that. I think, I feel like I learned that a lot from sports yeah. when I, from when I was younger, like from just the crazy football practices that we had, or, uh, I, I wrestled as well. And like, we had to, when we had to cut weight and they throw an ice on the, um, air conditioner to make it like 110 degrees in the room. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and just and just working through that, and you knew at some point that it was going to end, and and that you were going to you know get over it. But they would just they would always say like that you know the the as as you increase like your tolerance for what you can what you can take, you just become that much tougher. And I think that that can be applied to really like you said like anything in life that you want to you want to be able to um, roll thing roll through things a little smoother. Yeah. You know, and who wouldn't want to have, have challenging obstacles become easier to overcome. And it's a pretty simple way to do it by just pushing yourself a little harder. Yeah. I, I had a great martial arts instructor who would tell us to embrace the suck. Like, if, <laughs> I mean, he would torture us, you know, like in our classes and our warm ups and our exercises, but he had this miraculous power to like understand your limitations better than you did. Like I've could have sworn I was going to die many times, but he knew like, now you got a little more in the tank. And, uh-huh. and then he would say things like, you know, you, you, now that you know what it's like to do something hard and can, and you know, you can do it now. The next thing that comes up that's hard is a little bit easier for you. You, you have that understanding that you can get through this. You know, if you just determine yourself, if you just set your mind to it and it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I guess like the physical duress is an easy way to access that, but it applies to everything mental. I mean, it's invaluable. Those, those lessons, they might seem like, um, you know, you, you whatever on the surface, but like the deep down, like struggles you go through and to come out on the other side that empowers you. And, and in the future, when you are in those situations, you can draw on that and say, well, I've made it through that. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I thought absolutely. I was going to die doing that yesterday. So this is going to be okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good. Sure. It's good stuff to have in the tank to persevere. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe going back a little bit, um, when you, um, first moved to Nashville to, pursue a musical career, um, open a studio, whatever it might've been. Um, what was it like for the people around you in your life when you make this announcement, when you say, okay, (laughs) I'm going to Nashville and I'm going to start a career in music. Um, was that something you had to overcome too? Just, uh, to, I guess you can tell me whether you, you, you've found a lot of support or a lot of like, Hey, uh, Sean, you know, let's think about this rationally. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so that decision was made much earlier than before I moved to Nashville. Uh, I made that decision in high school, like mm-hmm. formally made that decision at, well, like a, as like a junior in high school, not to move to Nashville, but to make a living in the music industry. I started moving towards being at the place where I was going to make that decision when I was 12. So my, it was either that I was going to be like a professional hockey player or I was going to be in the music industry. And that was sort of like my two <laughs> options. Uh, I, I wasn't very interested in traditional education or going to a university. I thought that the system didn't make sense for someone like me that knew what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I didn't need to learn all of these things and put myself in tens of thousands of dollars of debt. Um, just to get a degree, um, when I could 
go out in the world and, and start my you know career on my own. That was the only point where I had any like pushback. And that was from my parents because they came from a time where, you know, you go to college and you get a degree and, you know, you get a, get a job and they weren't unsupportive of my passion for music, but they didn't understand. And I really didn't know yet. So it was, I had to figure out how to explain it to them, but they didn't understand how I could make a living without a degree. That was just something that like, you know, you had to do. So I started doing research and learning about the people that I looked up to that were legends in the, in the recording industry and started to learn about their stories. And then I told my parents those stories and that gave them a little more openness, but it didn't really change their mind. And there was, uh, an agreement, I guess, that they really believed that I needed to get a, you know, a degree. Um, and so I found a trade school in Minneapolis that I could go to for, I think it was like a year and a half to get an associate's degree. And that was the, like, that was pretty, pr pretty much the only point that I had someone kind of push back. But I think that the, maybe the reason for that was that I decided when I was so young mm. and, uh, there was none of my friends or like anyone else ever questioned it because they knew as, as well, um, that there, that, that, that was like, that was what I decided. That was the, the only option. Um, I saw somebody from high school, uh, a couple of weeks ago and they were like, man, so crazy with that you like knew what you wanted to do at that age. Like none of us had any idea and you just, were laser focused and you knew what it was and you're going to make it happen one way or another. And at that time, like back then, I never re even thought about it. It was just like, I had made my decision. This is what I wanted to do. I felt like that's what I was meant to do and was going to get the most fulfillment out of. And there was never a backup plan for me. There was never like a second thought of doing anything else. It was just hundred percent focused on figuring out how to do it, not mm -hmm. questioning whether or not it was possible. Uh, but that wasn't something that like I read in a book and then to, get, to convince myself to do. It was just how I thought about it, I guess. Uh, and I never really considered that thought process much until I got older and, you know, people start to mention that to you and like, and that sort of thing. Um, but no, there, there, there wasn't, the, that was the only thing was just that, that idea at first. Uh, but then I just, I learned about the business and I was able to make a pretty strong case for how it's possible. And there's people that came before me that, that did it. I know that I can figure out a way to do it. Hmm. Yeah, I guess having it just like a part of your story from the beginning does help. Like people are like, yeah, this is what he said he's going to do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is cool. But the, I think, and maybe this is like, um, is part of like mind map too, is it that focus, you know, just having that uh, idea of what you want is so key in in everything really i guess but because you just figure it out you find a way you, you know where you're going you just okay well this came up well i gotta get through this it's it it becomes less of like oh no i can't do this because this happened it became well this is part of my journey this is one of the things i'm going through or around to get there yeah like, absolutely that, that mindset uh, and that, is, that is a big part of that uh, program one of the one of the first things that we do is is make a list of anything that we've ever considered as a backup plan and then write it down physically write it down and then cross each one of them off and it seems like a little bit of like a hokey exercise but I tell you when when I've had artists go through that they realize the things that they were just kind of holding in the back of their head as being like their safety net just in case you know this thing doesn't work out and then they started to see how detrimental that can be to decision making and to taking risk and like diving into something and um not being um focused enough on taking action now feeling like well yeah, i'll do it tomorrow or whatever but once you realize that there's no other option there's there's no other option than to work yeah. on it and uh and start to make it happen but as we say all of those things you know it sounds it's it's easy to say those things and actually implementing them is very challenging and I don't hide at all the fact that like, even at the place that I'm at in my career, I'm nowhere near where I want to be and where I, where I know that I will be. And the adversity doesn't stop when you reach the point where you get a uh, number one record on the radio or you, you work uh, on a, on a huge project or with a huge artist that you, um, you know, had dreamed about working with, you know, as a kid or something, uh, or you own a studio 
uh, and and you know move through these you know these uh, these stages that that were all these milestones and these very specific goals that I set for myself that I um, systematically worked towards. But once you once you get those, that doesn't mean that like it's over or that it's easy. Um, I still struggle with that. Um, art. I guess it's just like an artistic curse of just sort of self doubt um, being. Uh, just on a on a constant search for fulfillment or understanding of things at a higher level. I think that's why a lot of us as creatives dive into these sort of things in the first place is that we, we're just exploratory creatures and we're intuitive and we want to learn and discover more about ourselves and about other people and, mm-hmm. uh, and all of that. So that, that, that's a lifelong journey and like in search that, you know, that doesn't stop, which leads to this, ongoing sort of roller coaster of experiencing these really, really high points. And then like directly after like accomplishing one of the best things that you wanted to accomplish, uh, then feeling like, well, what do I do now? And like, is this going to last? Then having the fear, like, is this going to you know continue on? And so I, I, for me, it's a, it's a daily practice that starts in the morning, uh, when I first wake up to be able to put my mind and my focus in the proper state to not let those thoughts take over the action that I'm taking and and my, um, my process throughout the day. And once I started doing that, it became a lot easier, uh, to be able to overcome that stuff. But by no means do I talk about this stuff as a way that like, Oh, well, I got it all figured out. This is, you know, super easy. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily get like super easy. You just, you find, find, uh, new ways to be able to, uh, work through it and find solutions for them as they come along. Yeah, that's like a a big part of growing up. I think you just start to realize like, oh, I I, I did that. And, uh, you know, you, you never like, you don't get there. You know, you're always going there. You, you never, there's never a time in your life where you just are, are done, you know, and you just coast off like every single section of your life is still another journey that you have to really pursue i think we maybe are are sort of taught that whether intentionally or not that like this will make you happy this once you do this you know then that'll be good but it it just doesn't seem to be the case you mentioned um something that you do something every morning is it is it an actual like routine or ritual you have to get yourself in this mindset absolutely yeah, it's really important, and it's it started as a smaller thing, um, and then it's continued to grow, and um, and now it's pretty pretty solid. It's about like two hours, uh, maybe two and a half hour, like long process. Um, the uh, the first thing that I had to do to be able to make this a consistent thing was to um, choose like working hours because that was a really challenging thing early mm-hmm. on. And for anyone that's worked in a studio or like the recording industry, your hours are, can be crazy. And if you get a call from you know, a very, uh, uh, from anybody that, you know, that needs your services at midnight, you got to go to the studio and, you know, and do it. Uh, and that was the process for a long time of just sort of like, I could never find like a consistent sort of cycle with things. And, uh, eventually that was, that was another like kind of hard decision that I had to, uh, make to be able to move forward and to be able to get into the next tier of my career was really finding a little bit more balance uh, between things. And, uh, that doesn't mean that like I can have a structured nine to five work day. I don't, there's, there's that, that, I believe that's impossible if you want to excel at a really high level in the industry, but you can have balance and you can find that, that control. So one of the, one of the things that I did was start to, um, at least like cut off sessions on as much of a regular basis as I could to be done working by like nine o'clock each day. So my, my general work day, um, starts at 9 AM and ends at 9 PM. Uh, sometimes it goes a little bit later. Um, and these days I work like Monday through Friday and then our, my engineers um, run the studio on the weekends, but, uh, obviously I didn't start there. So I had to move towards that over time. Once I was able to find a pretty solid like sleep schedule, which was really important to be able to maintain this on a consistent basis. Then I started working on my, uh, morning ritual, and um, that starts with uh, waking up and, and through this whole process, I do not touch technology. So I don't look at my email. I don't look at social media. Um, if, I, if I pick up my phone, it's only to turn music on 
or to uh, listen to a video uh, while I'm exercising. Uh, that's something that I, that I do a lot is listening to podcasts, listening to people um, giving presentations about things, just something that's going to get my mind in the right place for however I'm kind of feeling that morning. Uh, but I, I wake up, uh, I have a small breakfast to make sure that I'm getting my, my blood sugar and my body like in a good place. Uh, and then I work out for about an hour and a half. Uh, I read for about a half an hour, uh, meditate for about 20 minutes. Uh, and then I read my goals and my, um, intention, uh, for like the, the current goals that I have. And then my, my intention and my mission, um, for the, my business uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then I start my, my day and, uh, and throughout that, that process, my focus is to be able to get my mind and my body aligned and in a place where I can take on whatever nonsense happens throughout the day and be able to feel in control of myself and, and not get overwhelmed in those, uh, those scenarios. Um, and also to make sure that I'm starting every day with some type of education, which is a big reason why I read and a big reason why I listen to, um, to things, to people like doing presentations or talking or something like that while I'm working out. Uh, is to is to open up my mind to new ideas and new thoughts. And for me, like in the morning, I feel like that's a really strong place to be able to start that sort of practice because your mind, at least my mind, f- feels the most open at that time. It's not overwhelmed with all the thoughts of the day and everything that you got to worry about. And uh, and so that um, that's the ritual that I that I started a few years ago, and it's it's really helped me find a really solid um, balance in, in in my mindset. Um, and is, is improved my like health as well. And, um, just, you know, feel great. Um, but that, that ritual actually starts the night before the first, the last thing that I do when I get done working is I review my schedule for the following day. And that way it's just another like added level of, of ability to be able to be completely, um, completely separated from responsibilities when I wake up in the morning. So I can be a hundred percent focused on me Mm -hmm. and my, and my, and my mindset. So I, um, I, I sort of do like a play by play of what's going to happen the night before. Uh, and that way I can go through this whole process and I've already sort of memorized what I'm doing for the day. So I don't have to think about it. I don't have to wake up and be like, who do I have to call? What do I have to get back to? And what, what time do I start? I have all of that stored and, uh, and ready to go. So once I'm done with my morning ritual, I can dive into it. And, and then at the end of the next day, I review my schedule and then, uh, go to sleep and, um, am really able to. I've been able to find a really strong balance through that process. Mm. Well, that's a considerable amount of time too. I could imagine the argument people might make against that would be, you know, I don't have the time for that or it's how do I fit that in? Um, yeah, totally. I'm, Wake up earlier. I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing that you're finding the benefits um, and the, and the cost of time to be worth the, um, you know, the effort, I guess. Um, so you, you get much more out of it by putting in that time. Absolutely. Makes, makes yeah. Well, sense. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a great statement when people say stuff like that and he goes, sleep faster. <laughs> like I need, you know, they say I need more sleep and he goes, sleep faster. It's funny. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I totally understand that. And that was my thought process too, for a long time. Uh, I would, I'd be working instead of like now when I work like, you know, 12, 12 ish hour days, uh, I used to work like 16, 18 hour days and in like seven days a week. And so I was like, there's no time for, and I've been active and fit, like when played sports since I was a little kid. So, um, the, when I started really diving into this, like 18 hours a day, seven days a week, but sitting in the studio, you know, my body was not happy and, mm-hmm. in a, you know, in a good place. But my, what I was saying is, well, I don't have time. I have to focus on my career. I have to be working this much in order to be able to outwork the other people around me and find the opportunities and and have the type of career that I want. But then eventually I learned that there are ways to be able to balance that time out and find time for, you know, for things. When you start to look at the time that you waste doing things that are not, that are maybe non-productive or, or not even like, I don't mean to say non-productive because fun is very important. Like having fun in life is equally as important to just, you know, to, to doing whatever, you know, work is. But if you're doing work that you love, then you're having fun all the time. So there's, it's a, it becomes a little bit easier to find that balance, I guess. So that might be my, you know, argument around it. Uh, but I look at, I looked at how much time I would be wasting in between things. 
and what I was focusing my like non-working time on. And when you break down your calendar, like if you just like, I, I do it on my iCal, uh, my entire day is scheduled out from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and uh, leaves leaves me eight hours for sleep and, uh, and everything else I have uh, laid out. And as soon as I started to do that, uh, I found that there was more time than I thought that I had because I used to say, I don't have enough time. But then once I actually put the things that I wanted to accomplish that day on a calendar, set reasonable amounts of time to do them, I realized like, oh man, I'm like, I'm like wasting an hour here. I could move this around and get this, you know, get this done. So I, I don't think that that's a, um, I would argue pretty strongly against that um, argument when people say that they don't have the time. You can make the time. I I I believe that, and and I say that from the place of being in that position before and saying that exact same thing. But I, I really I really believe that you can, and it becomes so much easier when you spend your time doing stuff that you that you they're working or finding a job that you that you're really passionate about and that you love doing, because that that makes the twelve fourteen hours a day um, not feel like a grind. It's just it's just having fun and doing what you love. Mm-hmm. It's like doing your hobby and getting you know getting paid for it. Mm-hmm. Which makes it, a, I, I feel like, a bit easier to be able to, for me to be able to say, well, I can find the time to do these, you know, do these other things because uh, I don't need distractions. Uh, and it's not of like a trying to like uh, be like an intense, you know, person where like, oh, I can focus on his success. Uh, but it's, sure. uh, it's just, I, I'm, I'm very focused on on those things, but uh, from a very fulfilling way and a purposeful way. So it doesn't. Um, I guess like overwhelm me in that way just to spend that amount of time um, focused on it because I know how it's helping overall. And once you start to see the results, like you, you got to find the time. If, if I am in a scenario where, um, where like I, I, I get stuck working really late and like can wake up late and I don't have that time for it, my whole day feels like out of whack now because it's become such a strong uh, habit and has such a great impact, you know, on me throughout the day but i believe that there's there's ways to do it it's just a matter of of finding the time for it and deciding how important it is to you yeah yeah i think anytime you really look at how you're actually spending your time if you if you pay attention i've done this on occasion where i actually look at like what i'm doing throughout the whole day and you realize how much is lost doing nothing doing nonsense wasting time um, and, and I, I think wasting time in that, like you, you're just the kind of, um, there's no focus to what you're doing. And, and, and while you're in those states, half the time you are feeling guilty that you're not doing the things you feel like you should be doing anyway. So you're not even getting the real enjoyment of the leisure time anyway. You're just <laughs> feeling right. bad on, on yourself for not doing it. I think the idea to to choose those work hours, especially like, um, for artists, creatives and entrepreneurs is so crucial because you can work on it 24 seven. There's no, there's no, I mean, when I go to school, there's a bell, right. And, and it tells you you're done, it's over. And, and even like teaching was, it's a job that can consume you. You bring it home with you. You have to plan lessons. You have to grade things. Uh, you have to really, for me, I, it was advice I got early on was like, you have to put a limit on it. You know, you, you can't let this consume you your whole day, every day. You're going to hate it soon. And um, I think this is just like so important that when you're, when you're doing something that you've decided, I'm doing this. Even if it, if it is an hour I'm gonna, or two, I'm going to watch a movie. Like, this is what I'm doing. And to just be in that and be okay with that because you know you've got everything else planned out as it needs to be, then you can actually enjoy your leisure time instead of having that, that like pressure and guilt. So I, Absolutely. I, 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 I'm with you 100% on that. I, I was curious to see how you would um, defend that because yeah. to, no, to I most understand. people... I have to defend it all the time. <laughs> to, yeah, to most people, like two hours is a long time it, it, to to dedicate to something like that. But I, I think when you feel the effects of it, you know, when you work out early in the morning and then you start your day, you feel like a superhero. You're, you're like ahead oh, yeah. of everyone else. Like, um, it's so empowering. You're already geared up for the day. And 
I, I think the quality of work you get out of that time, even if it, even if it's two hours less, it's just so much more solid. It, yeah, absolutely. Better well, the, and then the other thing that's really important is that like, that's my practice. So that doesn't need to be everyone's practice. Mm -hmm. I don't advocate that like everyone spend two hours doing that. That's just what I've found personally to be like that happy medium of where I can accomplish those things that make me feel really ready to take on the day. And, um, and I had to make a conscious effort to start to get up earlier in order to have time to, you know, to do that. But when I started, it was not that at all. I mean, it was like a 30 minute workout and, and that was it. It was just like getting back in shape, you know, mm -hmm. at first. And then once I started getting more in shape, then I was like, cool, now I'm going to like work out for an hour. And then, uh, and then I got more excited about like l listening to uh, like informational sort of stuff or stuff that would put my mind in a good place for the day. And then I was like, well, why don't I spend like a little bit of time when I'm done, I'm, I'm cooling down, um, reading. And then, so over time it, it got, it created into that. I wouldn't like advocate that someone jump right into two hours. That's like doing, that's like, uh, you know, your new year's resolution and being like, I'm yeah. going to run 10 miles a day and do yoga for three hours <laughs> and eat nothing but lettuce. And, uh, you know, and then by, uh, uh, January 3rd, um, you know, you're definitely not doing any of those things. Yeah. Yeah. Easy so it, it's, it's, um, <laughs> my, my, uh, my buddy, Ricky, that, that we did the program with, he, um, he talks about the consistency of the action is not what, or the, uh, the scale of the action is not important. The consistency of the action is what's important. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I tell artists that I work with, if you spend five minutes before you got to pick up your phone or start to distract yourself with stuff, at least just do that. Just spend five minutes, just have your guitar next to your bed, pick it up, just play the first thing that comes to mind. Just put yourself in some sort of place, have a journal, start writing things that you're grateful for. You know, those, those typical, you know, people th sometimes think those things are like hokey, but there's so much power in that to be able to put your, put your mindset in that, in that place to be able to take on the day. So it can be like, you know, it can be very small. Well, I, I, one thing I've learned through doing some meditation is that every single thing you experience, everything that happens to you, everything that you do is filtered through your mind. And if, and it, it's like... You, you know, it's like when you like have like the colors, you can like, like a color filter where you can make everything green, everything blue or something. Um, you, you just, um, your entire experience is going to be colored by however your mind is feeling. And to just take some time and, and to get that in order can change everything. It can make a miserable experience enjoyable. It can, like we were talking about pulling weeds, like mm -hmm. the action is the same. Nothing changed except inside your head and how you're deciding to think about it. And yeah, absolutely. It, it's incredible how that same exact activity can be miserable or happy. And, and, um, you know, we've all gone to parties and had miserable times, I'm sure. I, mm -hmm. what's that about? You're going to a party, you know what I mean? <laughs> like that's by definition a celebration and you're not having uh -huh. a good time. That's, that's in your head most of the time. Yeah. And, and, um, it's, it, yeah, it's so powerful. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear you talk about that. Just, just to inspire me to like do that more, just to remember how important it is. Cause sometimes it is easy to, that's an easy thing to cut. You know, like when you, when you realize if you feel short on time or whatever, it's, it's the often like feels like the least consequential thing to take out of your day. But I think, um, like you said, that consistency is just so important that it's, it might be the worst thing to take out of your day in a lot of cases. Yeah. I, I felt, well, for, for me, it's, um, it would, it would be seemingly that that would be like the easier thing to take away. But now that I've created that habit and feel so compelled, um, to make sure that I maintain that practice. Like that would be the last thing that I would want to change now. Um, just because of how much impact that I've seen that it, you know, that it's had. And with the, the idea of like having working hours, something that I think is really important within that is that that's not just like when you're working and getting paid for your like services, if you're like an engineer or if you're like an artist, it's not just when you have shows. Uh, well, I look at those working hours as being the time that I'm working on my career period. So if I get a day where a session gets canceled from uh, the, maybe the morning session from like 10 to two gets canceled, uh, that doesn't mean that I get up later or that I stay up later the night before and that I just scratch out my like plan in the morning 
um, I still up and I'm still here at that time. And then I have this whole list of smaller tasks to work on um, that I just plop into those places whenever there's some some free mm-hmm. time. And it's a really great way to be able to um, maintain that like inspiration uh, over time because if we if we just are like waiting for the the time where um, where we just get like a, a a break or like some freedom you know from it, then that's kind of like just you know hoping that your office doesn't open someday and you know that you won't go in. We want to be focused on on working on on that every day. And it, when I when I was able to start organizing my schedule in that way, I found that I was able to move. I was able to stay more inspired because I felt like I was accomplishing more throughout the week, even if it was just really small things. But it was just this, the the practice of doing it and then the small little wins that you would get from like making that phone call and having that conversation and then getting a call back a few weeks later, days later, where, you know, you, you land a gig because you just happened to catch up with that person that you've been meaning to catch up with, but, you know, just kept forgetting to, you know, to make the call. So instead of like, doing something different that would just be like a distraction. Um, I would, I'd spend that time on one of those like small tasks and I just keep a little list on the, on the left side of my calendar. And whenever I have a little moment, then I just go look at the list and find something to, you know, to throw on there, which, uh, which can be really, really helpful. And, um, I think when, when, when I talk about the, the working hours thing, people think about it, like the hours that they have to be in the, um, in the office, or if you're like a recording engineer, like the, the hours that you're booked on sessions and then the other hours are just, you know, whatever. And that's cool. Like if that's the type, if that's the life that fulfills you, but if you're looking for something, um, a little bit more sub- substantial or even like a little more security, um, or like long-term, you know, fulfillment as opposed to just like chasing the gig or feeling like you're always kind of just trying to find the next thing to land on instead of really finding like a stride with things for me starting to focus on how I spent my time in that way just totally transformed the experience that I was having of chasing a gig and then getting into a place where things were just kind of feeling like they're they're firing and and building momentum you know in a strong way mm. well, yeah well I guess you're not just running sessions you're you're running a business you're running a whole production here and and also another another thing with the mind map so defining your work day from whatever out or whatever hour allows you to work on all of those things whenever you have the time to do it and then allows you to not work on them when you're not there when, when the time's off so you can enjoy the other stuff yeah absolutely and that's really important you got to mm-hmm. schedule fun in there's there's no no way around that it's got to be in there and that's something that i didn't do for a long time and uh, my relationships suffered uh, because of it, and um, my my um, inspiration um, suffered when I was just hundred percent focused on the career and not making time for fun and enjoyment and people around me. Uh, and so that was definitely a, a big shift that happened, uh, I guess, a number of years ago. Now to 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 find that that way of starting to work towards that balance. Hmm. So I wanted to ask you on, on the topic of inspiration, and you may have answered this a little bit already, but um, with, uh, you know, right now it's July 2020, and we've all been going through um, crazy times, um, coronavirus lockdowns and so much division in, in the country and everything. Um, I found myself really feeling like um, a lack of inspiration for a little while there. And um, I was having a hard time making music and, and making my podcast even, just kind of feeling like a little bit of a like, what's the point, you know, <laughs> kind of feeling. Because, uh, you know, as I, I, you know, we talked about this a little bit, like music is important, you know, we think back to like the art that has influenced us in our lives and changed us and defined our values. It's, it really is a big part of like who I am as a person and and who a lot of people I know are as people, but it can, I guess, sometimes feel, Oh, this is how I was feeling anyway, like playing around with my sounds when everything in the world is falling apart. You know, it feels like a trivial thing. And um, it really wasn't until I was talking with my wife about it, like, I, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm out of ideas. I'm out of inspiration. And um, 
she kind of said, maybe this is what you should do is talk about that. And that's kind of what it became is I, I, one of the last podcasts I did, I just talked about that, why music is important and why we should do it. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of, um, it was one of those episodes I did where I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and I got a decent amount of emails from people just saying like, yeah, I know what you're saying. I'm going through that. I'm feeling that. So it makes me believe that there's probably a lot of people now that are having a hard time like finding meaning in some of their work. And um, I was just curious, um, you know, how do you stay inspired in that? Is Do you go through that? Do you ever run into these issues? Maybe recently, I don't know how this has, all, has affected you and your work in the last few months being locked down and everything, but how do you maintain that? Because it's, it's crucial that you do to keep things afloat. I mean, in your work, especially, you know, running a studio, it's, if, if you're not going to do it, no one's going to do it for you. So how do you keep yeah. that going? Um, and, and have you run into that issue at all? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that's like a, a curse of, you know, creative people in general, and not just when there's a crazy pandemic and, and all this insane stuff in our country going on. Um, it, that's just, that's just like the, a day in the, the life, you know, that, we're on this constant battle with ourselves about like the value of the art that we're creating, the impact that we're actually going to have the, uh, like, what is, what is the meaning of it? You know, is this even worth, you know, worth it? What, you know, are we, are we tricking ourselves into thinking that we, you know, that we matter? Like all of those thoughts I, um, I struggle with. And the biggest thing that I've found that has helped me come back to my center with uh, with that focus is, th- I guess two things, thinking about what my passion is and what impact I want to have with my music, and then thinking about the times or the moments in life when I really had those like turning point places from a really young age of when music just had such an impact on me and how great it made me feel. And I just go to those places. And you ever seen Happy Gilmore? You go to your happy place, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they, you just, you go to those, uh, that, you know, that place or that experience that just puts you at, at peace or maybe that brings you back to like, yes, this is why I'm doing this. Uh, the, the, t- what am I thinking? You know, of course this matters. Um, it matters because it matters to me. It matters because I, I want to have an, an impact on others and I want other people to be able to experience the, um, you know, the, the feelings that I've had. And then the other thing that can help with that a lot is recognizing that, at least for me, recognizing that as much as I want to have an impact, I want the art that I create to have an impact on the world in a, in a positive way, uh, I still have to be creating it for me and for the artists that I'm working with. Because if we focus too much on the recognition, you know, behind it, at some point, you're there's going to be a project that you work on or a song that you release that just doesn't get as much love or attention, and maybe it's something that just made more sense for you, or maybe it just wasn't the right time, or maybe the um, Instagram Instagram algorithm got changed that week and it just kind of screwed up your, you know, your your stuff, and that doesn't mean that the art that you created doesn't have meaning or that it's not purposeful. It was purposeful when you thought about it and created it and, you know, put it together. So, um, yes, I struggle with that all the time. I think every artist does. And I've talked with artists at the highest levels of the industry that you would, you would think have it made, like have everything that they could ever imagine. And even those types of artists struggle with those same things. Mm. And, and I've always been, I I was always really interested and scared to ask them about those sort of things. But once you you know, develop a certain relationship, you know, with people who can kind of ask a little more, you know, personal things and just, and I'm just very vulnerable and like open when, when I'm working with artists, because I think it's the best way to be able to create great art is just be very like open and have a trustworthy, you know, environment to work in. And, uh, and so I'll share like my challenges and like, how do you feel about this? Or do you ever, you know, run across that? And I can tell you, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you're at as a, as an artistic person, you're going to run across that, you know, at some point. I think we all uh, we all struggle with it, but we just go back to why we're doing it, and what inspired us to do it in the first place, and patience, just taking the time to know that this will pass, and 
we'll we'll get back into that you know that mode. Sometimes you just need a break from it. Um, sometimes you just need a little bit of a change of perspective, and uh, you know to recenter it. But um, yeah, I mean, I, like it's a running joke with my wife that like at least twice a year I tell her my career's over. <laughs> Where you just get get to that place where I'm like, man, you know, I just I I, I didn't get a call today. I'm worried that like this thing isn't going to happen. I just I don't know how I'm going to keep keep it going, you know. And uh, my buddy Sean, who's my my best friend, he was the best man in uh, my wedding, and I'm going to be the best man in his wedding. Um, he has been a person that's really brought me down to earth whenever I've been in that place. We talk all the time, and I'll share, you know, kind of just feeling stuck or like just having this, this hope that something was going to come through that ended up not, you know, working out. And I'm like, man, I just, I don't see how I'm going to get there or seeing other people around me that had reached something or got something or were a part of something that I wished that I was able to do. And then I just feel like I'm getting behind and, um, you know, you just go through those, those processes and he's the one that's really brought me back to like, dude, are you kidding me? Like, look at the conversations we had in your driveway when we were 15 and, the, the stuff that, that you said you were going to do, look at all the stuff that you went and did. Like, are you insane? You know, just like, look at the experiences that you've had and, um, you know, and all of that. And, and, uh, you just got to be patient and let this journey happen. And I think it just comes back to just appreciating that this too, this moment right now, this very challenging place that we're all in, um, is just a part of that, that journey. And if maybe it's not for some people, it might be very inspiring, if it's not inspiring and it's more like uninspiring or scary, you know, and that just understand that like at some point there, it'll, it'll come around and we'll get, you know, we'll get back to that, but it's just all part of that, um, that experience. Uh, and I think the a thing that can really help is really started to help me was to understand that everybody goes through it and that I wasn't like by myself and it wasn't that like I was weak or like uninspired or, not strong enough to be able to work through things. It's like everybody goes through this. It's just that people don't like share about it and talk about it as much. Mm. Well, I will say, um, when you answered my question with like, Oh yeah, all the time, <laughs> you know, there was a part of me that like kind of was like, Oh, you know, good. <laughs> not that I want you yeah, to right, feel exactly. uninspired, but like, you know, it's nice to like, know that like this happens, this is what people go through. And, and, um, yeah, even like getting like some emails on this topic, like it was nice, you know, not that again, I want people to be struggling, but it was nice to know you're not alone and that it is yeah. like a natural part of the process. And maybe it's even like fuel for some of the creative stuff you do again in the future. You know, like a lot of the great art is made out of the suffering. It's it's one of the like beauties of art is that we can take difficult things and make it into something beautiful. Um, But... Yeah, uh, it's 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 comforting. It, it is, you know. And even what you said, like some of the like most successful artists, it just goes again the show. Like, um, you, there's no getting there. There's no like arriving. It's it's always like a striving and reaching, and that has to be the thing we enjoy and focus on enjoying. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that that at least for me, I haven't found the ultimate solution. It's an it's been an ongoing battle, but having the realization that that's going to be the deal has been really helpful in dealing with it. But even knowing it, you know how you can like know something is, is true or going to happen, but you still like are uncomfortable about it. Yeah. That's been like my experience still is that even though I know that truth and that I've found um, that understanding um, that we're always going to be on this, on this journey, it still doesn't take away the, those experiences where you just get stuck and you're like, man, and you lose sight of that. But the more that you practice it, the more that it becomes easier to flip that switch when you get in that state and, uh, you know, and start, uh, be able to change the, the perspective with things. Mm. I think in this, this time that we're in right now, the biggest thing that's helped me maintain sanity is the, an agreement that I made with myself when this first started that I wasn't going to change my routine in the morning that I was going to get up and, and dress properly each day, uh, that I was going to show up to the studio just like I was working in the studio with a bunch of people, but I'm going to be sitting here staring at this Zoom camera and uh, working with people remotely. Um, but I, w I needed to be able to maintain some type of like normal within my life to be able to find that, you know, that balance. And that lasted for about a month. 
And then I about lost it. I was like, oh my God, what is going on? And there were like maybe a few days where I just really had to like get away from things because it was, it just felt like, I felt like, okay, cool. Well, this is going to last for like about a month, you know? And then when like a month was over and it was like, yeah, this is going to last like forever. Uh, they were like every day something is changing. It, it, um, it definitely like wears on you, you yeah. know? But then I was able to take the, these habits that I've built and these experiences and reframe that process and say, look, you started this on the right path. Like we, we can maintain certain senses of, uh, of normalcy around this. And through doing that, we'll be able to maintain our inspiration in some way. And, uh, and then what I started to find when I got past that first, like kind of, you know, breakdown or hurdle in this whole situation was that my mind just started opening up to all these amazing ideas. I had like a little more time and that time was great to have because it just got me thinking about things that we could do. And so I started brainstorming like creative ways that we could still work with artists uh, beyond just like a Zoom session. But, um, and, uh, and we started thinking about ways to be able to support artists with live streaming um, solutions that would be no contact, like in the studio that could be all like automated, but you come in and do a really high end live stream from the studio. Um, and then I started coming up with ideas for like, uh, new like platforms and stuff and just all, all kinds of, you know, different things that were, that I, that I've just been exploring now. Uh, and so you look at all of that and it's like, well, uh, you know, I would never say that this is a good time. Uh, you know, there's so many people that are hurting and so much, uh, just very, challenging things that we're all dealing with. Um, but if you can take that perspective and say, well, look at the opportunity that we have right now to be able to grow and learn and what, what actually comes out of all this, if it, if it, if it comes out with like growth and, um, that, that's a really beautiful thing. And I think that that's, as you said, like the whole, um, great power that creative people have is taking really challenging situations and then reframing them or creating something beautiful around that experience. And so if we look at that whole mentality, I think that that's a great reminder for us when we're struggling with all of the craziness that's going on right now and trying to figure out how to navigate this new way of living. Mm. A lot of growth usually comes out of challenges and difficult times. And if things are just sailing along smoothly, there's not a lot of reason to change course and to grow. So that's that's definitely a nice way to look at it. Has yeah. there been anything um, that you've come across in your work at the studio or working in sessions that you think might you might continue to do, even if, say, somewhere down the road we're back to our old normal? Like yeah, I get asked that question a lot, and yeah, we and, we, and I've been talking to, about that topic a lot with people. Um, especially other studio managers and stuff, but I don't know yet uh, yeah. because the the studio experience is such a environment. The studio environment is such an intimate experience that I feel like it's challenging to 100% replicate what we would do on a grand scale in a remote environment. Mm -hmm. There's some things. I mean, we've we've found solutions to be able to get by for now. But I can't imagine that people would want to stay in that place if things like tomorrow were back to normal. I feel like there's nobody's going to call me and be like, "Hey, you want to set up a Zoom session?" They're going to want to yeah. be here, right? And I think that's just the nature of our of our work. I think that other industries are definitely going to see some major changes in how that and how they operate, and understanding some maybe even like some cost savings with things, and you know, having offices that they don't need, and you know, th those sorts of things, but. Um, I, but I think for studios, it's going to be, uh, an interesting, um, process to see, you know, how things might, might shift. I think there's a couple things that I hope will remain. One is live streaming. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that we'll be able to, through all the platforms that are coming out now and the new like user experience. And now that more fans of music have been becoming, uh, accustomed to seeing a bunch of music performances on their, on their, uh, their feed, uh, more often than before. Uh, my hope is that that's going to grow into a new promotional model and a new revenue model for artists. Um, I know Facebook is working towards some things that are going to make that very possible. And 
it, as that as that happens, I think that studios, at least my studio, I know that that we we've we're setting our, we're setting ourselves up to be um, a really strong competitor to broadcast uh, live performances at a super high level, um, and uh, and be able to support artists within that that new shift. So. Uh, for that reason, but also because of the impact that I'm seeing it have on many artists and their ability to reach their fans in a in a uh, broader way, uh, I think that that'll definitely have an impact. Or uh, that sh- shift, I think, is going to be a, a lasting impact. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point, and I could see that being um, an interesting thing. Even like um, live streaming sessions or par- portions of sessions occasionally you know letting letting the artists there's been a lot of like um uh letting the audience into your home and into your personal life like um artists are playing in their like in their kitchen you know playing guitar i watch neil young is playing in his barn you know uh-huh. john fogarty's out on a ranch or something playing his songs like it's just really cool to get that other side like uh, here here are these artists these legends and they're at their home doing their thing in the most intimate way with just an acoustic guitar. I could see right. just that that view in. Maybe it's it's like, all right, we're gonna try to lay down vocals today, and uh, you know, it's not a produced show. It's just this is the reality of what it is. It could be pretty cool. Yeah, I've I've wanted to do something like that, and we have we have, but not live. So we do a lot of content like that where we have a crew here and they're capturing the process. And fans love it. Like people really love seeing the creative process. And um, for someone that's never been in a recording studio before, like they, they see how the whole thing comes together and it's this new understanding of what they're listening to. Uh, I love it because it reminds me of like when I started to learn about this stuff as a kid and it brings me back to like those, those moments. I mean, I think it's so cool, but um, the challenge with taking that into like the live streaming world, a uh, couple of things like, copyrights and Mm. uh, material that's sort of being created in the moment and there's a little bit of a I mean there's definitely like it's a it's a intimate you know experience which is great to share with other people but I think it's more comfortable for for the artist to share it with people afterwards you know not necessarily in the moment Uh, as much as we love having a crew here and like in capturing content throughout the creative process I would never be like cutting a final vocal on an emotional ballad with an artist and have a camera in their face. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just, it, it's just a distraction that's unnecessary. But if we're working through arrangements, if we're, we're rocking out with the band in the, in the room and just getting basic tracks down, like all that stuff is so cool um, to capture. And, and the, the, in, in, in those cases, I c- we can kind of make our, our video crew invisible. They're just kind of sitting in the back, just kind of capturing moments, you know, here and there. And then we can piece it together into some really cool, um, content. Uh, but something that could be a really interesting thing that, that I've talked with a few artists about is, um, a, like for the fan club, being able to give them private access to like a specific, uh, session, uh, something mm-hmm. that like you, you, you wouldn't, you'd have to make sure that it's like encrypted and can't be like, you know, stolen or recorded. And obviously there's always people, you know, people who have ways around, you know, doing that, but, uh, to be able to give, you know, give uh, people like an inside look at something in a, in a really exclusive way. And, and so I think that that might be another change that may hang on uh, for a while after this is this idea of a more uh, virtual, per- personalized virtual experience uh, that artists will be able to provide with fans and fans that are going to want to experience it because, um, you know, there's, there's no concerts to go to and, uh, and now they become, they become used to it. So when it becomes like a new way of, you know, of experiencing things now, like, why wouldn't they want to like watch a show on a Wednesday night when they can't go out to the, you know, to the stadium to see it, but the artist is in their, in their house playing and you know, that you can, there's, there's artists that are, um, you know, really generating some substantial revenue just at home, you know, doing it. And, mm. uh, I think that there's uh there's definitely a, uh, the big potential for that to continue on in the future. Mm. Yeah, I think so. I think it'll, it was uh, and still is like exciting for me to see like some of those different sides of the artists and you don't always get that stripped down thing. And, and I guess I, I see your point too. It, it it's kind of hard to like conjure up those deep emotions at the camera right on you sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, I want, <laughs> all right, from the heart now, <laughs> and, right. like, I'm going to have this box in your face, but 
I, th- I think it's a good way to look at it, you know, and, and maybe it's it's the only way to look at it, you know, because we can't really change the situation anyway. So we have to work with it and we have to figure out positive ways to deal with it. The- yep. That's the that's the strongest point about that. The whole discussion about how to how to deal with these things and the question get asked a lot, like, what's your covid pivot and what are you doing to, you know, to different and like and for me, I'm like, man, I've been an. And a, a creative entrepreneur for the past, I don't know, 15 years, uh, or longer. And, uh, I mean, this is normal for me. Like I'm always, always thinking pivoting. creatively yeah. <laughs> about how to do something different and what, what's really like the point of talking about what's going wrong. There's nothing that we can do to change it. So let's think about how we can just grow and, you know, and, and move around it instead of debating the things that don't have a ton of impact you know, mm-hmm. long-term, but really looking for ways that we can create change. Um, and not just in our careers, but obviously in all the other ways that, um, uh, within our society, uh, the things that need to be, you know, adjusted and stuff. And, um, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity for growth, um, right now. There's a JFK said that, um, in crisis, there's always opportunity. And he said like the, the, um, that the Chinese, um, translation for crisis is actually opportunity. And, uh, and I got really excited when I read that, that quote, I was like, that is so awesome. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, and then I did some research luckily before I shared it and that's not true. It's sort of like a, one of those things that got like misconstrued, you know, in translation. Yeah. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the statement and the, the, the preface of the statement is still very powerful. Well, it doesn't But if you were wondering if crisis you, right? actually <laughs> translated to opportunity, it doesn't. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes uh, we don't need to let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with politicians. If it if it makes you feel better, then uh, it doesn't sound like it's that harmful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I, just, I thought it was it was funny when I when I looked it up and and found that. Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> hey, listen, it's been really nice talking to you. Um, and you as well. I, on a personal level, I I feel inspired. So thank you. And. It, your energy is, is really nice. And, and I think that's, um, probably one of the, uh, reasons for your success. So thanks for sharing that with us. And yeah, well, th- thank you. That's my sole purpose in wanting to get out and, and have these conversations, uh, is just to be able to tell a story and hopefully inspire someone because there were people out there that did it for me. And I feel like I'm in a place now where I've had the, ex- uh, you know, enough experiences that, could be helpful for someone else. And I, I really hope, like hope that it is. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, I just want to be a resource for people to help them grow and be able to find the same fulfillment in life that I've discovered through being able to really zero in on what your passion is and then find a way to fight for it and, uh, and be able to live it on a daily basis. Nice. That's a, that's a good mission. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just to collect money. That's a nice mission, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what I found is that, well with, yeah. yeah, if you follow something that you're passionate about and authentic about it, like the money follows you. There's mm-hmm. no sense in, in chasing money. I Don't get me wrong. I love money and, and I love being able to do great things with, you know, with money. But, um, but just going after it for that purpose, I don't think it lasts very long. And I, I, I started to see all of that stuff work itself out a lot faster when, I was just focused on impact and the fulfillment uh, and how I could serve other people first. And then that all comes back to you, in my opinion. Right. Well, then, yeah, I, I think um, without that, you're you're not going to serve people. You're going to – I mean, we've seen it time and time again, right? Uh, unscrupulous decisions are made to, like, raise the uh, the profit margins and all, so – that never, that never does anyone any good in the long run. <laughs> nope. So we could send people to the record shop, Nashville.com to check out the studio. It's, it's beautiful. Absolutely. It's studio. Um, Thank and, you. And I can understand why people want to go there for the vibe and be in person and, and have that um, really looks like it has a nice feeling to it. Thank you. And then, then there's mindmaptribe.com to learn more about mind map. Yep. Is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people, send them? No, that's it. I mean, we're on social media and stuff. It'd be great to have a conversation there. Uh, the main thing that I like to tell everybody is that on the contact page of my website, um, you can send me a message. It'll get directed to me. 
And if you're looking for help, for guidance, for support, um, somebody to talk to, somebody to get advice from, trying to figure out how to make a career out of the thing that you're passionate about, uh, I am more than happy to help you. I answer every single email that I get sent because I know how challenging it was for me early on to stare at an empty inbox and see a bunch of messages that I sent out that no one responded to. Mm. And the few people that did gave me the hope that there were people out there to, to help and support. And they gave me the understanding that I could achieve this if I went after it. And I want to be able to be that for other people. So if you're looking for someone to, to help that can give you some direction, I'm more than happy to do that. It is not a sales pitch. I don't have any like hidden agenda other than helping other people uh, and, and ha- helping them have the same fulfillment in life that I have. So uh, regardless of where you're at or what the, uh, within your, your uh, stage of your career um, or the career that you want to go after, um, you can feel free to contact me and I'd be more than happy to do whatever I can to, uh, to help give you some direction and advice if that's something that could be helpful for you. Nice. That's really cool of you because uh, it can be uh, tough to make connections and contacts. And I, I know that feeling of sending out emails and then that's it. They just went out and you don't hear anything. So um, I think that's a, that's a nice thing to give back. Cause yeah, the, the people that have um, helped me and helped me through things have um, really made all the difference. So thanks for Absolutely. that. All right then. Well, I guess we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thanks so much for taking the time. It's really great to talk to you. And um, yeah, everybody check out the record shop, Nashville.com. Go to mindmaptribe.com and, and drop Sean a letter. Let him know uh, what you think of what he's doing. I think it's great work. So take care, everybody. Have a great day.